Thank you for joining us in our study on what does the Bible really teach about homosexuality by Kevin DeYoung. This is the fourth teaching on this subject matter. We're in the fourth chapter. I pray that you have purchased the book or you will purchase it and you will read it. We are discussing each chapter. There's 12 chapters in this book and we are on the fourth chapter during this study. I also want to mention uh, that we always want to understand where the author's coming from. So I always want to highlight the author's background. And that is that Dr. DeYoung is a pastor of Christ Covenant Church in Matthews, North Carolina. He holds a BA from Hood College, Masters of Divinity from Gordon, Cornell Theological Seminary. He has a philosophy doctorate from the University of Lysista. And so it's always important to understand the background of the author, because if you understand the person's background, and he and he's considered to be a theologian, a reform, a reformed theologian. So uh, that plays a part in his interpretation, his knowledge. We know he comes to this subject matter with some knowledge, and so we just want to be open to what it is that he's sharing. Uh, I must use a slogan my past use uses often and that is I don't want you to think like me but I want you to think and this is what these Bible studies have been all about it's about opening our mind expanding our mind one thing about when you go off to school undergrad and graduate school is that you're challenged to broaden one's thinking and how you should think and not how you should think but to broaden one's concepts and world view how we perceive things. College helps us to think outside of the box. And so that's what these Bible studies have been all about. We may have one, we may believe one thing, and uh, once we expand our knowledge of a subject matter, we, we understand it even better. And so that's what these studies have been all about. I pray that you will chat uh, as this video is playing, or being viewed, that you will be a part of our active chatting as this video is playing. Uh, this is, as I mentioned, the fourth chapter, and it's entitled, The Romans Road in the Wrong Direction. The Romans Road in the Wrong Direction. Let us pray. God, we thank you so much for allowing us once again to come together on this day, this evening, to, to once again to share your word. Lord, I pray that this word will enlighten our knowledge, that it will help us to understand that which you are uh, sharing with us through this author. We thank you for the privilege. We pray, God, that others will join us, that we will share this Bible study with, with, with others so that others can be a part of this study. God, we believe that you have given this ministry to broaden our knowledge, that not only can we be a part of a church, but we can also glean from others outside of our immediate circle. And so, God, we thank you and we bless you in Jesus' name, amen. The Romans rode in the wrong direction. The Romans rode in the wrong direction. In the wrong direction. Significant treatment of homosexuality is found in the first chapter of the book of Romans. Romans 1, according to the author, reinforces with unambiguous clarity 
seen up to this point from the Old Testament, namely that of homosexual practice is a serious sin and violation of God's created order. Let me repeat that again. Romans chapter 1 reinforces with unambiguous clarity seen up to this point from the Old Testament, namely that homosexual practice is a serious sin and violation of God's created order. Wrath is revealed in verses 18 and 20. For the wrath, 18 and 20. Let me see. It says here, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness 20th verse for since the creation of the world his invisible attributes god is his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse what does that mean? This verse serves as a topic sentence for this entire section. In addition, it stands in contrastive parallel to verse 17. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. So, what are we saying? This verse serves as a topic sentence for the entire section. In addition, it stands in con contrasted parallel to verse 17. The continued revelation, the verb is being revealed in this present tense. The wrath of God is an expression of his personal righteousness, which also is being revealed and is opposition to human sinfulness. Therefore, people need to continuing revelation of a righteousness from God. Therefore, people need us to continue revel, revel, revelation, unveiling, unveiling, continue revelation of, a, of the righteousness from God in verse 17, that he provides. God's wrath is directed against all uncleanness. As as obedient, lack of proper reverence for God, to revere God, reference God, reverence God, and wickedness. Akidian, Adidikian, Adidikian, unrighteousness of men, not against the men as such. God's wrath will also reveal in the future. God hates sin and judges it, but loves sinners and desires their salvation. Okay. Failure to give God his due inevitable results in failure to treat people created by God in his image right away. Conversely, people in their unrighteousness towards others continue to suppress the truth concerning both God and man. People had God's truth, but suppress it, refusing to heed it. And these wicked 
And these wicked ones did this in an attitude of wickedness. This suppression of the truth is Paul's first reason for God's condemnation of the pagan world. So we see here, he says here, the wrath in verses 18 and 20 through 20. Wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the world and the things that have been made. So you look at creation, you, you have to be able to, one would have to come to some conclusion that creation has a, I always say this, I've said it for many years, that creation has a built-in in intelligence. And so one would have to ask the question, well, where did the intelligence originate? Where, how is it that the world seems like everything just moves in, everything is in sync? The, the seasons, the sun, the moon, the orbiting of planets, you know, things just, you know, the birds start chirping around five o'clock every morning. There's so much order. The wind blows, God's ru ruach, ruach, that's how you put, yeah, ruach, the, you know, his, his breath, the wind is blowing, God's ruach, the same breath that's in us, the same breath that's in, in, in animals, they have God's ruach, ruach, yeah, that's the word, ruach, but yeah, so the same thing, so you see this order, so what we can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since ever since the world and the things that have been made, so that they are without excuse. Righteousness of God is revealed through the saving message of the gospel found in 16 and 17. In 16 and 17, Paul says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, good news of Jesus Christ, that he lived and he died for our sins. For I'm not ashamed, Paul has said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, unrighteousness of God is the for in it, the righteousness, or not the unrighteous, but the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written. But the righteousness of man shall live by faith. So righteousness of God is revealed through the saving message of the gospel, while the wrath of God is revealed through God's punishment of ungodliness and unrighteousness in verse 18. Both revelations depend upon knowledge. Both, res re both revelations depend upon knowledge, cannot be saved by faith apart from the knowledge of the gospel. And that's in uh, uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 14. Let's go there. Romans chapter 10, verse 14 and 15. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I didn't do something right here. Romans chapter 10, verse 14 and 15. How then will they call on him? How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how 
will they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent, just as it's written? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. However, they did not all heed the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So in essence, it's through the knowledge of the preacher, those who are willing to share the gospel of Jesus Christ cannot be saved with, by faith apart from the knowledge of the gospel. And that's what that is alluding to. We will not be judged except that we have some knowledge of God through the created order of the world. And we find that in Romans chapter 1. It says that here we will not be judged except that we have some knowledge of God through the created world. So in essence, if you go to Romans chapter 1, back to Romans chapter 1. Chapter 1, verses 19 through 20. We see here, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. So God is saying that, he's saying, Paul is telling the church at Rome that God has already, you, you, we, every person has a built-in mechanism to acknowledge and to believe in a God, in God, not in a God, but to believe in the God. He says that here, he says that we will not be judged except that we have some knowledge of God through the created world. So in essence, because that which is known about God is evident within them, but God made it evident to them. So in essence, God has, there's a, there's a, there's a part of, me, of mankind that 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 God is built in to, to to recognize God but because of sin those who are not come into the knowledge of God that 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 that's that that inner person that God created to know God has been suppressed because of sin sin has has buried what God has already placed in all of us to know him. And so Paul is telling the church at Rome that we will be judged because as in essence, everything around us is hollering, God, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. But because of sin, we, we, we don't see God's we don't see God in, in everything. God is always a God does not condemn the innocent and the ignorant. Verses 19 and 20 inform us that none are innocent because none are wholly ignorant. None of us are. It says, it says here in verse 19 and 20, informing us that none are innocent because none are wholly ignorant ignorant in essence in essence you may or we may deny god but but paul is saying none of us are innocent because god is screaming out everywhere we go the plants beautiful unique looking plants where did that uniqueness come from where did all that beauty come from when you've gone off and gone to Aruba and, and and at Hawaii and seen these beautiful places, and you just you you take in all of this beauty and, and, and these surroundings, and you never say to yourself, what, "How did it? How could this be? What? what how, how, did this just come about?" And so Paul is telling the church at Rome that there really is no excuse. God does not. He says here. He says here. He says here, verses 19 and 20, informing us that none are innocent because none are wholly uh, ignorant. In essence, you, 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 you're not totally ignorant of what's going on. He says, and let me go here. Let me, let me go to Romans. 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 
Romans 3, verse 10. It says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside together. They have become useless. There is none who does good. There is none. There is not even one. So in essence, he's telling us. He's telling us. He's telling us, he's telling us, yeah, telling us, as it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is none, no, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues, they keep deceiving. The poison of Alps is under their lips. Those mouths is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their path. And the, and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their lips. That sounds like Paul is writing writing to today. It sounds like today, the natural world and from the law written in our own hearts, we know the truth about God or at least enough of the truth to leave us without excuse. And we find that in, in that there's enough about so there's no escaping. Let's see. Many people who don't even acknowledge God, don't even reverence God, don't even don't don't do anything to demonstrate one's faith in God. And Paul is saying there's no excuse. You have no excuse when it come down to it. And we stand before God. There's going to be no excuse. Let's go to 19 verse one through six. Okay, I did something wrong again. Let me see here. Did something wrong again. Okay. Psalm 19, verse 1. Verses 1 through 6. It says here, the heavens, the heavens are telling of the glory of God. Just look up. That's what he's saying. The heavens is telling the glory of God and their expanses declare the work of his hands. Day to day pours forth his speech. How can we not hear it? How can we not see it? And the night to night reveals his knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. The line has, the line has gone out through all the earth and their utterness to the end of the world. In them he has placed a tent for the sun, which is as, the, as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. It rejoices as a strong man to run his course. It is rising, it's rising is from one end of the heavens and its circuit to the other end of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. David announced that the heavens declare the glory of God, the splendor of God's handiwork. Verse 1 is a summary statement of majestic creation is evidence of the even more majestic creator of God. The heavens continually, day after day, Night after night display the fact that there is a creator. Even though creation does not speak audibly in words, its message voice goes out to the ends of the earth. The message from nature about the glory of God reaches all nations and is equally equal, intelligently to them 
dominant in the heavens is the sun like a bridegroom who excitingly leaves his house on his wedding day the sun rises and like a champion runner racing on his course the sun makes its circuit these verses do not do more than speak of nature as a witness to god's glory they also undermine pagan beliefs for the same imagery was used of the sun god in ancient near eastern literature join the parallel these verses do more than speak of nature as a witness to god's glory they also undermine pagan beliefs for the same imagery was used of the sun god in ancient near eastern literature literature amen i love when the god's word comes together now let's go back to romans chapter one let's jump back into romans chapter one chapter one verses 21 through 23. okay it says here For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and of four-footed animals and crawling creatures. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, exchanged the glory of the immortal God for image, resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. The ungodliness of men in exchanging the glory of the immortal God for the foolishness of idolatry. We find in verse 23. Instead of giving thanks to God of heaven, the nations of the world worship images resembling human beings, birds, animals, creeping things, and or sometimes less visible but not less insidious idols of power money and approval are no better this is what the author is saying then we find in verse 24 therefore god gave them over in the lust of their hearts now god gave them over to the lust of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them for they exchanged the truth of god for a lie and worshiped and served the create create creator and worship and serve the creator rather than the serve the cre creature rather than the creator who bless forever in our men so what is being said here? Therefore, God gave them up to the lust of their hearts, to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they engaged the truth of, about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forevermore. See, see the ungodliness of men exchanging the truth about god for a lie pagan people of the world serving the creature the creature instead of worship and creator the transition from the first to the second exchange is marked by god giving them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity god the transition the author is telling us the transition from the first to the second exchange is marked by giving them up in the lust of their heart so that's 
because they lust after other things instead of lusting after God. God says, okay, you want to be lustful? You want to be lustful? You want to go after what it is that you want? I'm going to let you go. So God progressively handing sinners over to more and more ungodliness. God giving them up to uncleanness is a word in the New Testament associated with immorality, especially with sexual immorality. The Apostle Paul is not thinking of mere ritual uncleanness from the way in which he uses the, this word ungodliness. In, in his writings, you see it. You see, the Apostle Paul is 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 the Apostle Paul is not thinking of mere ritual uncleanness from the way in which he uses this word uncleanness. The word uncleanness in his writings, you find that in in Romans chapter six and nineteen. Romans chapter six. Chapter six. Verse 19, I'm speaking, he says, I'm speaking in human terms because of the wickedness of your flesh, for just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slave, slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. So he shows us. Goes to Second Corinthians. Let's see what he says over there. Second Corinthians. Paul wrote quite a few books. Twenty-one. He says here, two and twenty-one. He says, "I am afraid that when I come again, my God may humiliate me before you." And I may mourn over many of those who have sinned in, in, in the past and not repented of the impurity, immorality, and sensuality which they have practiced. So you see here, more, more of this unrighteousness, uncleanness. Find the same thing over in Galatians. Let's go to Galatians. Galatians 5 and 19. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality. So you see here, Paul, is he, he speaks a lot of it. Go to Ephesians chapter 4. Go to Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 19, and they have become callous, having given themselves over to centrality, centrality, for the practice of every kind of impurity with greedness. So you see here, Paul wrote extensively about that. Then he goes back and says, they exchange. Let's see what they exchange. Let's go back to Romans. Go back to Romans 1, verse 26, 27. It says here, it says here, for this reason God gave them over to degrading passions reprobate mind for their women exchange the natural function for that which is unnatural against nature and in the same way also the men abandon the natural function of the woman and burn in their desire towards one another men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. What is Paul saying? Also, God gave them over to shameful lust, passions of disgrace, disgrace, 
This involved, as the text states, both sexes engaging in homosexual homosexual instead of heterosexual relationship. Women deliberately exchange natural relations with men in marriage for unnatural ones with other women. This is the second exchange the un, un, unregenerate made. Men were inflamed with lust, sexual lust used only here in the New Testament and in differing from the more common word for lust in verse 26. The words translated women and men in these verses are the sexual words females and males. Contemporary homosexuals insist that these verses mean that it is perverse for a heterosexual male or female to engage in homosexual relations, but it is not perverse perverse for a homosexual male or female to do so since homosexuality is such a person's natural preference let me read that again the word translated women and men in these verses are the sexual words females and male contemporary homosexuals insist that these verses contemporary homosexuals insist that these verses mean that it is perverse for a heterosexual male, heterosexual male or female to engage in homosexual relations. It's contemporary homosexuals insist that these verses mean that it is perverse for homos for a heterosexual male or female to engage in homosexual relations, but it is not perverse for a homosexual male or female to do so since homosexuality is such a person's natural preference okay so it's all right for if it's a natural preference it, this commentary is is alluding as it all that it's all right contemporary homosexuals insist that these verses mean that it is perverse for a heterosexual male or female to engage in homosexual relations but it is not perverse for homosexual male or female to do so since homosexuality is such a person's natural preference. This is strain exegesis. I would agree. Exegesis means to extract from the text. This is a strain exegesis to, to unsupport it by, by the Bible. So so far for so let me go back and help everyone to understand what this is saying. Contemporary homosexuals insist that these verses mean that it is perverse for, for heterosexual male or females to engage in homosexual relations, but it is not perverse for a homosexual male or female to do so since homosexuality is such a person's natural preference. This The author saying that well, the commentary is saying this is a strain exegesis to extract that for a homosexual to see this being just the opposite for them because this is their natural preference. This is a strain exegesis unsupported by the Bible. The only natural sexual relationship the Bible recognizes is heterosexual one. Going back to Genesis chapter 1, we said the Lord God calls the deep sleep to fall upon the man in he slept, then he took one of the of his ribs and closed up the flesh of, of that place. And the Lord fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She should be called woman because she was taken out of man. And for this reason, a man should leave his father and his mother and should be joined to his wife and they should become one flesh. And that's the that's the intercourse, that's the union between the husband and the wife. And so, see, the only natural sexual relationship the Bible recognizes heterosexual. And you find that in that, you also see it in uh in Matthew's gospel, chapter 19, verses 4 and 6, where it says, And he answered and said, Have you not read, this is Jesus, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made 
than male and female and said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. But therefore God has joined together, let no man put on. So Jesus was quoting from Genesis 2 in Matthew's gospel, chapter 19, verses four and six. All homosexual relations constitute sexual perversion and are subject to God's judgment. Such lustful and indecent acts have within them the seeds of punishment due penalty. And so we see here, for this reason, God gave them up to dishonored passions for their women exchanged the natural relations of those that are contrary to nature. Going back to the beginning, going back to God's created order. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with the woman and were consumed with passions for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their God handling the Gentiles over to dishonor passions, giving up natural relations with members of the opposite sex for relation with those of the same sex. He would have embraced the Old Testament distinctions between unintentional sins and high-handed sins in Numbers chapter 15 verses 27 and 31. His point is more illustrative than uh, evaluate. Okay, so what the author is saying that he would have embraced the Old Testament distinctions between unintentional Okay, so what the author is saying that Paul, he's saying that the Apostle Paul would have embraced the Old Testament distinctions between unintentional sins and high-handed sins found in Numbers. Let's go there. Numbers chapter, okay, he's saying that the Apostle Paul go Numbers chapter 15, 15 verse 27 through 31. Okay, so what the author is saying that Paul would have embraced the Old Testament distinction between unintentional sins and high-handed sins. His point is more illustrative than evaluate than evaluative. So it also if one person sins unintentionally, then he shall offer a one year old female goat for a sin offering. The priest shall make atonement before the Lord for the person who goes astray when he sins unintentionally, make an atonement for him that he may be forgiven. You shall have no law for him who does anything unintentionally. Okay, so he's saying here that he would have embraced, okay, so what the author is saying that the Apostle Paul would have embraced the Old Testament distinction between unintentional sins and high-handed sins. His point is more illustrative than evaluative. Than evaluative. The Apostle Paul, same-sex, sex, the Apostle Paul, same-sex central intimacy is clearly of the adul adulterous human impulse to turn away from God's order and design. So what's happening is suppressing the truth about God as revealed in nature, suppressing the truth about themselves written in nature. So in essence, what the what the author is saying is that what the author is saying is that that those who commit homosexual acts, men with men, women with women, are suppressing the truth. They're suppressing the truth. That's what that's what he's saying. He's saying that that they're suppressing the truth. He's saying here, he says, he says here, suppressing the truth about God as revealed in nature, suppressing the truth about themselves written in nature. So he's saying that those who commit homosexual acts are suppressing the truth found in God's creation. That's why he goes, he talks about the creation and how, how, let's go back up. 
he, go, he, he goes back, he talks about for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes. So God is, he's pointing to all of creation. And this is a pretext. This is a pretext. And so you got to take it in context. If he's saying, you know, they are without excuse because the created order is letting us know there is a God. And so out of all of the things that God has already created, professing to be wise, they became fools, they exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image. You know, your, your car becomes your God, your job becomes your God. And, you know, we put everything before God. So God says, you know, you want to do all that. And then as a progression, you then become central to the extent that you you, you, you forego the opposite sex for the same sex. So it's just a, it's a continuation of, 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 of evolving. And just this, this is a buildup. And so in essence, he's saying that they're suppressing the truth about God as revealed in nature, suppressing the truth about themselves written. And so not only are suppressing what has been revealed in creation, but you're also suppressing the truth that God has already placed within you, but you have denied it because of your unrighteousness and your sinfulness. And so Paul is thinking of homosexual activity in the general sense and just a bad kind of homosexuality. The issue is not master-slave relationship or other sexual abuse more generally because Paul speaks of both parties being consumed with passion for one another, found in verse 27. In the same, he says, in the same way also the men abandon the natural function of the woman and burn in their desire towards one another, men with men committing indecent acts and revealing in their own uh, persons the due penalty for their error. So in essence, he says that the issue is exchanging the natural relationship between a man and a woman for an unnatural same-sex relationship. Again, he says revisionist authors argue that excess was the real problem, that excess wanting to try or to be with the same sex, this is excessive. And so he's saying revisionist, revisionist theologians see the big problem as being in excess. Excess is the real problem. The ungodliness for Paul were those who, though capable of heterosexual attraction, fully capable because we were created to be heterosexual, instead became dissatisfied with their usual sexual activity lusted after new experiences, new experiences and sought out homosexual encounters. So you weren't satisfied, it's saying that we weren't satisfied with our heterosexual uh, design, how God created us. We wanted to go a step further and participate in same sex. We wanted to try what, is, what it's like to be with someone of the same sex. And so God said, okay, you want to do that? Then I'm gonna let you do it. Let your mind, you know, your your reprobate mind, I'm allow you to go ahead on and go there. So homosexual practice in the ancient world was by men who also had sex with women. So homosexual practice in the ancient world was by men who also had sex with women. So this, we would call this in the 21st century bisexual. So what part? What so? Taking this in context, what this is saying to us is that we have to understand the ancient world at the time was that in the ancient world, men also had sex with women, heterosexual relationship. But now, back in the ancient world, they also had a problem with having sex with the same with the same sex. So this is where this is evolved. Homosexual practice in the ancient world was by men who also had sex with women. We would call that bisexual. But so this is in the context. So if you back in the ancient of days when this text was written, you were having heterosexual relationship, but all of a sudden you decide you want to be with a man or be with a woman of the same sex, then Paul is saying this is what this is the evolution of sinfulness. 
homosexuality is a sin because it's against God's good design. God didn't create us. We have the same genita genitals and so genitality. So why would we want to, it doesn't work. It's, it's we making something work that doesn't work. It's not, we weren't created. So every passion directed toward illegitimate ends was considered excessive and lacking in self-control. We find that in Titus. Let's go to Titus. Go to Titus. Go to Titus. Chapter 1. And verse 12. Yeah. Titus verse 1. One of one of themselves, a prophet of their own, said, Cretan, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy glut, gluttons. And so in essence, what is this saying? What is this saying? Lazy gluttonous, lazy gluttonous, lack, lacking self-control, contrary, doing things Okay, contrary to nature translates the Greek word paraphysin, phison, p h y s i m, paraphysin, meaning deviant forms of sexual activity, especially homosexual behavior. Paraphysin, used as a reference to homosexual practice in writers as uh, as diverse as as uh, Plato, Philo, Josephus, these philosophers employed the phrase contrary to nature to the same effect. When we participate in homosexual behavior, that is contrary to nature. We go back to the created order. God's invisible work is clearly seen. In essence, he's saying here, you're doing things that's contrary to nature, to God's created order. Contrary to his, contrary to nature, translate to the, the Greek word paraphysin, paraphysin, P-A-R-A, physin, P-H-Y-S-I-M, paraphysin, meaning deviant forms of sexual activity, especially homosexual behavior. Paraphysin used as reference to homosexual practice in writers as diverse as Plato, Philo, Josephus, these philosophers employed the phrase contrary to nature to the same effect. The Apostle Paul faults homosexuality for being contrary to nature. Genesis has much to say about homosexual practice. It's sinful because it violates the divine nature. Death deserved. He goes on and says, because of that, let me see here, let's, let's highlight this. He says here, and just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a deprived mind, reprobate mind, to do those things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanders, haters of God, insolent, insol insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And although they know the audience of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. God gave them up to a debased mind. Gave them to the base mind. The base mind produces a host of unrighteous thoughts. The base mind, a reprobate mind, should not make too much of homosexual sin given 
the long list of sins mentioned in verses 29 and 31. All of this should not make too much of homosexual sin. Homosexual sin is a part of all of this. Paul lumps it all together, filled with unrighteous wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, gossip, slander, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful, should not make too much of homosexual sin given the long list of sins mentioned in 29 through 30. Because the Apostle Paul singles out homosexuality as a conspicuous example of the human heart suppressing the truth and turning from God suggests that we should not soft pedal as no big deal what the Bible underlies as particularly egregious rebellion. The Apostle Paul says, therefore, you have no excuse. Therefore, you have no excuse. Therefore, you have no excuse. Therefore, you have no excuse for the passing judgment. It says here, therefore, you are, therefore, therefore, you have no excuse. Every one of you who passes judgment for in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself for you who judge practice the same judgment. And we know that judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. So in that sense, the Apostle Paul says, therefore, you have no excuse. Oh, man, everyone who judges for in passing judgment one on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the same thing. He is not claiming that everyone is guilty of every sin mentioned in Romans. He is not. Okay, let me go. Let me read this commentary. In any generalization, such as the preceding blanket of indictments of pagan hu humanity, exceptions to the rule always exist. Obviously, some pagans had high ethical standards and moral lifestyles and condemned the widespread moral corruption of their contemporaries. In addition, the Jews morally stood in sharp contrast with the pagan world around them and freely condemned the Gentiles. Both groups of moralists might conclude that God's condemnation did not apply to them because of their higher plans, planes of living. But the apostle, but Paul ins insisted that they also stood condemned because they were doing the same things for which they judged other. Therefore, Paul declared, at whatever point you judge the other, you are condemning yourself. Everyone in the entire human race has turned away from God and condemns sin, even though there are differences of the frequency, extent, and degree. In addition, the entire human race, especially more pagans and Jews, stood condemned before God and have no excuse because God's judgment is based on three divine standards, truth and impartiality, and Jesus Christ himself, which are absolute and inf infinite, condemning every person. So we see here, yeah, so we see here, he is not condemning that everyone is guilty of every sin mentioned in Romans chapter one or even in verses 28 through 32. But his point rather is that everyone is guilty of these sorts of sin. Everyone is guilty of these sorts of sins and in need of a savior. And no one is righteous. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That is conclusion towards which Paul is, is, is pressing. And if we go to uh, Romans chapter three, 
Romans chapter 3, verse. Yeah. Yeah, Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us. So the apostle Paul cases, okay, so he said, so he says here, therefore you have no excuse, O man, everyone who judges for in passing judgment on, on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same thing. He is not claiming that everyone is guilty of every sin mentioned in Romans chapter one, or even in verses 28 through 32. But his point rather that everyone is guilty of these sorts of sins and in need of a savior and no one is righteous all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of god that is conclusion towards which paul is is pressing paul wants us paul wants us to see our own sin does not mean that all more iniquity to be sin romans chapter 2 we see the indispensability of personal holiness. We see, so what he's saying that in Romans chapter two, we see the indispensable ability of personal holiness. And you see that in Romans chapter, Romans, Romans chapter six, verse, 1 through 23. What shall we then say? Are we to be continuous sin that grace may abound, may increase, may it never be? How shall we who die to sin let still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us have been baptized into Christ Jesus, have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. So it says, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him. Okay, if we all, if we've gone through this metamorphosis where we live, we were one way, but now he's saying that we now have, have evolved like a caterpillar becoming a butterfly. We now, we were, we were, we were in sin, but now we've been crucified. We've died to ourselves and we have morphed into this person. Not that we are so righteous, but that we, we, we are covered with the blood of Christ because we accepted him as our Lord and our savior. And we're trying our best with the help of the Holy Spirit to live a righteous life. So he said, knowing this, that our old self was crucified. We have to crucify. We have to kill off the old, the old person. You know, for me to live is, for me to uh, live is Christ, and me, and for me to die is gain. That's what the Apostle Paul says. So you die to self daily that you want to live for for Jesus Christ. So he says, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. And so we see here, Paul wants us to see our own sin does not mean that all moral iniquity to be sin. In Romans chapter two, we see the indispensability of personal holiness and the darkness of sexual immorality, the darkness of sexual immorality found in Romans chapter let's go to chapter 13 verses 11 through 14 do this do this knowing the time that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep for now salvation is nearer to us than we believe and he goes on to say he says, he says here, 
that night is almost gone and the day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not carousing and drinking, not in sexual promiscuity, sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lust. And so in essence, Romans, what he's saying here is that Romans chapter two, we see the indispensability of personal holiness and the darkness of sexual immorality. Our, uh, our, our, let me spell this word, A-K-A-T-H-A-R-S-I-A. -A -A. A -A, that word again, let me go back. Very quick, give me a few seconds. You give me a few seconds here. Our our cathedius, our cathedius here, our our a a cathedius here, our cath. Hmm, it's hard to pronounce these Greek words. Reprobate. I think this word means to. Let me. See, I'm trying to find it. Okay. Arcathidia. Arcathidia. Exposed in Romans one and twenty-four. Romans one and twenty-four. Romans one verse 24 therefore god gave them over to the lust of their hearts to the impurity to so that their bodies would be dishonored okay our our exposes in Romans 1 and 24 is the impurity exposed in Romans 6 and 9. In Romans 6 and 9, 6 verse 9. Knowing that Christ having been raised from the dead is never to die again, death no longer is master over him. And so what he's saying here, no, six and 19, let me, let me stop, six and 19. Okay, I am speaking in human terms because of the wickedness of your flesh, for just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness resulting in sanctify and sanctification and so what he's saying here is that uh, in the big picture there are a number of, of things that have been pointed out in the text that we that that homosexuality has been lumped into and so in essence what he's saying is that God is the let me see here it says that in Romans he says Romans chapter two we see the indispensability of personal holiness and the darkness of sexual immorality the and and this impurity has been exposed in Romans chapter six verse nineteen where it says and I'm speaking in human turn because of the weakness of your flesh for just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness resulting in sanctification. So if we go back to Romans chapter one. Let's go back to Romans chapter one. And we come down. Yeah, we come down. 
we come down there's a and this this will wrap things up he says here for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness all and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness okay the wrath of God this listen to this is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because that which is known about God is evident within them. God has placed a mechanism within all of us to know him, to know God. But we choose to suppress it because of sinfulness and that we desire to do whatever it is we want to do. Sinfulness originated in the Garden of Eden when, when Adam ate the forbidden fruit of good and evil. And from ever, from ever ever since then sin has been imputed upon all of us and i always give the analogy you don't have to raise a child to do mischievous things but you have to do you have to really work hard with your offspring or your offsprings to teach them to do what is right because because of sin and it was imputed upon us that we do just the opposite by nature, by not well, because of sin. Originally, that wasn't the case, but you know where I'm going with this is that we suppress the truth. That's because of the fall in the garden. That's because if you, you're a creationist, you believe the word of God, then you would believe what I, what is I'm saying. And so, for since the creation of the world. His invisible attributes, has been, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made. So in essence, uh, he's saying again, I'm concluding just as I started. Heaven declares his glory. You have to ask the question, why is it that things work the way that they do? And you come back and you say to me, I don't, it, it, it just does that. Well, that's not a good answer. You need to come back with something more in, infinitive, something more concrete to say, I believe things happen this way and there must be a God. Or you got to come up with a better answer than to say it just happens that way. You know, nature just creation just works. My human body just works. But how does it work? Where did it come from? How did that? How does the body work the way that it does? It look, it's it's like a a, a well created machine it's literally a machine in itself so much so that man is trying to replicate the human body and so it's just how marvelous it is so you have to ask the question where did it all come from so it says well even though they knew god god made a way you know created us they did not honor him or give thanks but they became futile in their speculations in their heart professing to be wise they became food and you got many people today they're very smart people very smart but they deny god professing to be wise but they're actually fools and exchange the glory of the incorruptible god for an image in the form of corruptible man of birds and four-footed animals we're worshiping objects and images therefore god gave them over to a lust of their hearts whatever you want to do god said go on and do it to the impurities so that their bodies would be dishonored amongst them there it is god said this is and it's a progression you deny god and you start just putting objects ahead of god and then it, not only do you put objects images then you also start you your body becomes a, an object that's so much so that you go with so then it's a progression. I'm going to let the text unfold for itself. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worship and serve the, cre the creature rather than the creator. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. For their women exchanged a natural function, which is unnatural. In the same way, the, also the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire towards one another. So there's a progression. So what we find in the text 
is that there's a constant progression. You deny the creation, then you begin to deny what God created originally, the, the created order, and you just progress. So the apostle Paul did have a strong condemnation for homosexuality, but what we see in the text is that we lift up homosexuality, but in, in the bigger picture, there's a progression. You deny the creation, you deny what you can see with your with the, with the naked eye, and then it's a constant, it's evolving, and it continues to, to perpetuate. And so homosexuality is just a continuation of what has already been put into motion because of sin. It's a progression. So we're going to end here. I want to thank everyone for tuning in for this fourth this fourth chapter in our teaching on the Romans road in the wrong direction. The Romans road in the wrong direction. I pray that you will be supportive of this ministry. I pray that this study has been informative. I pray that it has broadened your thoughts on, on homosexuality. I pray that you just keep your ears open. Just be open to what's being shared as we walk the text, as we walk the scriptures, as we read this book, delve into the scriptures, read a little uh, from some of the from this commentary on the right side of the of the of the of the video, the screen. But I want to thank you and please share this study with others. Please have invite others to be a part of our, our, our study. As I mentioned earlier, we have 12 chapters. We have uh, eight more to go. This is the fourth chapter. And uh, I pray that you will stay with us as we dialogue, uh, as we have dialogued during this session. Uh, may God bless you. May God keep you. Please be supportive. You feel so led to, to donate to our ministry. Ministry does cost money. It does cost money, and uh, I just pray that if you find it, or if God leads you to do so, please be a part of our ministry. Help us to spread the word. Help us to get the truth out. Help us to answer questions. But most of all, honor God in all that you do. And if you feel led to donate to our ministry, please do. Let us have a word of prayer. God, I thank you for each person who thought it not robbery to be on and to watch this video, to, to be a part of this study. I thank you, Lord, for those who, who were chatting with me live. I pray, oh God, that our conversation on tonight has, has been uh, glorified in heaven. We love you, Lord, and we uh, commit our tomorrow to you, that if you allow us to see the next day, we'll be so careful to give you all the honor and the glory in jesus name amen god bless you and may god keep you